Welcome back, podcast family. Welcome back to another episode of Under the Avocado Tree. Today, I am deeply and profoundly honored to have Dr. Tom O'Brien on the show. First of all and foremost, Dr. O'Brien is one of the leading minds in the world of functional medicine. He has authored some of the most important books in this field. We'll talk about them in a moment. Uh, He's been a a part of the IFM faculty now for many, many years and is considered to be a global advocate of the functional medicine movement. So I'm going to kind of tout you a little bit, Dr. Tom, if that's okay with you. Uh, Dr. Uh, Tom O'Brien holds a teaching faculty position with the Institute for Functional Medicine and National University of Health Sciences. His 2016 groundbreaking book, The Autoimmune Fix, won the National Book Award and ranked first in several categories on Amazon. The book outlines the step-by-step development of degenerative diseases and gives us the tools to identify our disease process years before the symptoms are obvious. Uh, He is also the founder of thedoctor.com, the dr.com and the visionary behind the Gluten Summit, A Grain of Truth, which brings together 29 of the world's experts on the gluten connection to diseases, disorders, and a wide range of symptoms. On top of that, uh, he also recently published You Can Fix Your Brain, uh, which I believe you can pick up a copy on his site, the the dr, the doctor.com, and he was just a main contributor to the Keto Summit, as I just learned. So thank you so much for being here with us, uh, Dr. O'Brien. Anything that I missed in your introduction? Oh, thanks, Dr. Bell. It was really kind of you. Um, well, there's one thing I think is really impactful, and that is my wife and I traveled the world, and we interviewed um, 85 different people. Um, and I... I went to the godfathers in autoimmunity. Uh, Yehuda Schoenfeld, Professor Schoenfeld in Tel Aviv, who 28 at the time of the interview, now it's more, of the PhD students who got their PhDs in immunology under him, 28 of them, there are many more, but 28 of them chair departments of immunology in med schools and hospitals around the world. They're his students. This is the godfather, right? And or Michael Marsh at Oxford, uh, you know, when you um, do an endoscopy looking for celiac disease, the classification is Marsh 1, Marsh 2, Marsh 3. This is Marsh, the godfather, or uh, uh, many more like that. And I knew the questions to ask them because I'd read their papers. So I didn't say, how did you get into immunology? You know, it, you know let's, let's dig right into it. Professor Schoenfeld, you, uh, your latest book called Vaccines and Autoimmunity, please tell us the correlation. And he said, we're very much in favor of vaccines. They save millions of lives. However, if a person carries the gene HLA-DRB1, they are extremely high risk of having a sensitivity re- reaction to the adjuvant in the vaccine. So those people, caution is advised in the administration of vaccines. Well, what do you mean by caution, Professor? Do you mean instead of giving three or six to an infant, give them one and wait a couple of weeks and give them another one? Yes, exactly. Caution is advised. And you hear from the godfathers about these concepts. And then I interviewed clinicians all over the world, seven different countries, who were following the principles of the godfathers. They had read the papers or they'd gone to functional medicine courses. And then I interviewed the patients of these clinicians who were compliant with the recommendations, reversing their MS, reversing their rheumatoid, reversing their chronic fatigue again and again and again. And we put this out as a docu-series. It's called Betrayal, the Autoimmune Disease Solution They're Not Telling You. And we've had over 600,000 people watch it. It's all free. It's at the doctor, the dr.com forward slash betrayal. And many docs, many clinicians 
have it running on a reel in their office in the waiting room. And what happened, because there's nine episodes, and what happens is that the nurse says, okay, doctor's ready. Oh, I'll be there in just a minute. I want to hear, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> but then the patient comes back and says, doc, do I have this leaky gut thing? Is this something that I should worry about or check for? Or they start, they're more informed and they're more empowered to ask questions and to be a participant in their health care. So it's really, um, we're very proud of it. We get emails literally every day from all over the world uh, thanking us. Uh, but that's called betrayal, the autoimmune disease solution they're not telling you. I'm very proud of that. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, in my, on, my, uh, on my end, Dr. Tom O'Brien, uh, I have to tell you that your example on your book, The Autoimmune Fix, how you describe the operation of the immune system um, as having an army, uh, you know, an air force, a navy, all those things. I can't even begin to tell you how many times I've utilized that example clinically, and it just resonates profoundly. The work that you've published has really positioned you in the minds of clinicians like myself and many others as one of the godfathers of what I would consider functional immunology. And so that's one of the reasons that I believe that it becomes so critically important to have an opinion like yours with everything that's going on right now. We're facing a worldwide crisis, a pandemic, and primarily a threat to our immune system. We know that our immune systems have been declining and become, becoming more and more compromised throughout the years because of all the changes in our environment and all the changes to our lifestyle. So as a leading immune expert, a worldwide leading immune and autoimmune expert, um, I think that your, your opinion on this topic becomes critically important for the public to begin to understand what are the potential implications of an infection like this, both currently and in the future. Well, thank you for that. And um, uh, I've been doing coffees with Dr. Tom uh, 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 on my uh, Facebook page. And uh, we did eight in a row every day. And now I do them once a week on Monday mornings at uh, nine o'clock Pacific. Um, and it's just so much fun to dive into the literature that's coming out around this pandemic and see what people are saying works and doesn't work. And I thought it'd be of value to share this. Um, this goes back to 2003, that I saw an article, uh, in one of the newspapers of all things, that said they had found four people who died in the 1918 pandemic flu who were buried on an army base in the Arctic tundra of Northern Alaska. And because they were buried in the tundra, they were perfectly preserved and they wanted to dig them up. And the article says, no, no, don't dig them up. Don't dig them up, taboo, taboo. But they, they dug them up and they did autopsy and biopsy and they discovered how these people died. And why was it? that these people died of this thing that they identified, they called it a cytokine storm. And that was in the early 2000s that they identified that. And macrophages in our lungs are first responders. And the way I explain it to patients is that, you know, your macrophage, it's, it's a special forces that are there to protect your lungs. And if anything gets in there that shouldn't be there, they fire a high powered rifle and a chemical bullet called a cytokine that destroys whatever the perceived threat is. Uh, but what happened to these people that died, they were healthy, young, vital army personnel. Um, their, their high powered rifle, the trigger got stuck and became a submachine gun. And that caused the inflammation and the uh, water retention and the pneumonia, and they died within 24 to 36 hours of first symptoms. These were the young, healthy people that th had been buried and they identified the cytokine storm in them. And what's that about? 
Well, I, you know, I was looking into that at the time. I said, well, that's really interesting. What, what's going on here? And uh, an article came out in 2004 in the journal Blood, and they talked about macrophages and vitamin D. And they identified that 25-hydroxy is not the activated form of vitamin D, and we know that, and it, it has to be converted to 125. But what they identified was that macrophages, activated macrophages, convert 25-hydroxy-D to 125-hydroxy-D, which then is an immunosuppressant. Vitamin D suppresses the immune system inside macrophages. And I read that, I said, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense to me. That's not what I've heard about vitamin D. And you just had to kind of sit with it. I had to read the paper a couple of times to really get it. You know, I'm a little slow at this kind of stuff sometimes. But then, oh, of course, that makes perfect sense. When you activate macrophages, it's like you're putting your pedal to the metal. You're flooring it so the macrophages can fight to protect you. It's like you're driving downhill. You know, you're just going really fast. You better have your foot on the brake if you're driving downhill so you can regulate how fast you're going. Right. Yeah. Well, with a so vitamin D 25 gets converted to 125 in activated macrophages to be the foot on the brake as you're accelerating. So there's a balance between the two. Stand uh, normal non activated macrophages do not convert 25 to 125, they have to be activated, turned on to produce cytokines. Then they convert one to, isn't the body beautiful how it works, right? Is that, I mean, I thought that was so cool that you want to have enough 25 in your bloodstream circulating so that you've got the raw material when you need it first to activate, to protect you, and then to put a foot on the brake so that you don't go into a cytokine storm. Now, that's not the only regulator of cytokine storms, but that's a primary one. Right, so it's good to know. Yeah, that's wonderful. It's almost like it has both an immunostimulating and immunomodulatory effect. Exactly. That's exactly. Fantastic. So one of the things that I'm very interested in discussing with you, uh, Dr. Tom, is this link between viruses and autoimmunity. It's a very well-established link. Um, can you kind of expand that a little bit for us and help us understand how um, viral infections can drive autoimmunity for maybe audiences that don't have a lot of exposure to this beforehand? You bet. You bet. Well, what we've been learning in the current pandemic is that the virus has to get inside the cell to shed. Right, we're all learning that. Some of us may not have studied as much virology in the past. And it goes through the ACE2 receptor, it gets inside the cell, and then it starts shedding, and um, uh, you, you, you can measure the RNA of it, uh, and that it's growing and growing and growing, it takes over the cell, gets into the DNA of the cell, kills the cell, uh, and then moves on to the next cell. Viruses have to get inside your cell to be a problem. When they get inside your cell, your immune system trying to protect you says, what is this? What is this? This isn't supposed to be here. And your immune system will go after that cell to destroy the virus. Well, if you think about a, a primary mechanism of uh, development of the autoimmune spectrum, and the autoimmune spectrum goes for years before you're diagnosed with the disease. You have to have elevated antibodies for a long time, years, killing off tissue, killing off tissue, killing off tissue until you kill off enough tissue that you start having symptoms of dysfunctional thyroid or dysfunctional brain or whatever it is. Symptoms, you go to a doc, go to a doc, go to a doc. Finally, you get a diagnosis of an autoimmune disease because you've killed off enough tissue that the tissue can't function properly anymore, right? So a primary mechanism in the spectrum in the development of autoimmune disease is called molecular mimicry. And what happens is that the immune system 
goes after something it recognizes as a foreign invader. And uh, uh, a virus is a really common one with celiac disease. Rotavirus 7 is really common. That's a common uh, cold flu virus. And if you make antibodies to that one, you can develop celiac disease because the antibodies out of molecular mimicry may go after the microvilli of your intestines and cause villus atrophy. And it was a virus that set it off. One of the mechanisms, another mechanism is when you form a neoepitope, a new compound. So bisphenol A as an example, this is in the chemical world, but it's the exact same thing with viruses. Bisphenol A binds onto our own tissue. Once it's in your bloodstream, it binds onto tissue. Just go to Google and type in bisphenol A and thyroid. And here come the studies of autoimmune thyroid disease associated with accumulations of bisphenol A. Bisphenol A binds onto your thyroid. Your immune system says, what is that? That's a neoepitope. That's something new that's not supposed to be there fires its chemical bullets at the BPA, uh, but it's attached to thyroid, so it causes this inflammation damaging the cell, the thyroid cell. Now your immune system has to get rid of the damaged cell, so you have a little increase in your thyroid antibody because it's got to get rid of the damaged thyroid cell. Not a problem. But when this keeps happening day after day after day, the result is you keep making antibodies to get rid of the collateral damage of the cell that the compound has bound to, and you keep making antibodies to thyroid, keep making antibodies to thyroid or to your brain or whatever tissue it is that the neoepitope has, the, the compound, the antigen has bound to, and until this becomes self-perpetuating, now you do, you're on the spectrum of autoimmunity for your thyroid. or with viruses, they, they easily go through the blood-brain barrier and get into the brain. And when they do uh, autopsy of people who have died of Alzheimer's and they, they um, biopsy and look at the beta amyloid plaque, they see it's loaded with antibodies to different viruses, cytomegalovirus, Epstein-Barr virus. The antibodies are loaded inside the beta amyloid plaque. Why? What's happening here? If you have a breach of your blood-brain barrier, I call that B4, capital B number four, breach of the blood-brain barrier, and these compounds, including viruses, get into the brain tissue, now your immune system says, what is this? And antibodies can be called in and get in there to go after that compound, whether there's over 246 studies, uh, it was eight months ago I checked or so, of herpes and Alzheimer's, herpes simplex one. That virus just gets in there. Your immune system, if, um, and when they do biopsy of Alzheimer's patients, they find elevated levels of IgM to herpes simplex one inside the beta amyloid plaque. Why? Well, the beta amyloid plaque is another response of your immune system to wall off this foreign thing that's there so that it can't reproduce, it can't get out, it can't go anywhere else. And beta amyloid plaque acts like a, a force field, if you will, this calcified force field around the herpes virus. And um, the, the papers are just jaw dropping when you read this. So viruses bind to cells. The immune system makes antibodies against the virus, IgM to begin with. Long term, it goes to IgA and IgG. And the antibodies against the virus attack the tissue that the, the compound has bound to. And that's a very common mechanism that can initiate autoimmune diseases. So the question becomes, a lot of people get viruses, uh, but not everybody moves into this autoimmune spectrum. So what are some of the factors that could increase the likelihood, decrease the likelihood of this happening? Exactly as Dr. Bland, our mentor, 
told us a few weeks ago about this current pandemic. This is a classic example of a lifestyle disease. So it's how we live our lives, how inflamed we are, how much damage do we have from the inflammation over the years? Are you carrying a spare tire around your midsection, right? Do you have insulin resistance, right? Uh, do you have cardiovascular disease? Uh, uh, do you have um, high percentage body fat? Are you in the category of over fat or obese? You know, some of the sickest people are the ones that look thin, but when you do body comp analysis, they're obese. They've got a high percent body fat and that fat uh, this midsection fat generates 17 different hormones, 15 of them are inflammatory, right? And so the more that you're packing, the more inflammation is circulating through your system. So it's a lifestyle that sets us up. And when you recognize that, and I think the only way to turn that around, really the only way, you know, in my more recent book, You Can Fix Your Brain, the subtitle of the book is just one hour a week to the best memory, productivity, and sleep you've ever had. And I believe that that is the only way, and I'll be bold enough to say the only way, that our patients can be successful in changing the paradigm of how they live their lives. That everyone's been born and raised in a society that tells them that brainwashes them into when you're not well, take the magic pill and you're well, you know, and on the commercials, they're well in like 15 seconds, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's immediate, right? Yeah. And that indoctrination is how we grew up thinking there has to be a quick fix. So let's get this fixed so I can go back to eating my ding dongs, mm -hmm. right? And we have to recognize it's lifestyle that sets us up for the autoimmune diseases we get, for the viral diseases that we fall prey to. It's lifestyle that determines how our body responds to these things. And the only way to change lifestyle is by changing the paradigm by which you live your life. And the only way to change the paradigm by how you live your life, well, a great example, 1980s, a biologist in uh, Australia named Barry Marshall. He writes a paper and says, you know, I think that sometimes ulcers are caused by a bacteria. And everyone said, what are you, a nutcase? <laughs> everyone knows that ulcers are caused by too much acid in the stomach. You're, you're way out there. And he was ostracized. So what did he do? The guy does an endoscopy, takes picture of the healthy pink tissue of his stomach. Then he drinks a beaker, a beaker of Heliobacter pylori, the bacteria, Heliobacter pylori. Waits a couple of weeks until he's really sick, does another endoscopy, takes a picture of his ulcerated stomach. Then he takes the antibiotics to kill Heliobacter, waits another couple of weeks, until he feels better, takes another endoscopy, pictures of the healthy pink tissue of his stomach. Then he publishes it. Then everybody knows he's a nutcase. <laughs> but he proves, you know, he proves <laughs> beyond a doubt that sometimes ulcers can be caused by a bacterial infection. And the World Health Organization thought that that paper was so important they sent it out to every medical society in the world saying, pick up on this. Why? Because at the time, the number one cancer in the world, mostly because of third world countries, was stomach cancer, which is caused by a heliobacter infection. Mm. So if doctors pick up on it early and get rid of the heliobacter, you prevent stomach cancer and mortality. So Barry Marshall was still thought of as a nutcase. He didn't care. 21 years later, the guy wins the Nobel Prize in physiology. And the Nobel Committee says, and this is the exact quote, who with tenacity and a prepared mind challenged prevailing dogma. Now that's the only way that our patients can change a paradigm 
is by tenacity. One hour a week, every week on Tuesday nights after dinner, Sunday mornings after services, whenever it is, but every week, I'm going to allocate one hour to learn one new thing and apply that principle. So with tenacity and a prepared mind, living, listening to podcasts like this, reading a couple of books, you're, you're preparing your mind and getting guidance on what to implement to challenge the prevailing dogma in your head that's led you to live a lifestyle that's made you not well, right? So with tenacity and a prepared mind, challenging prevailing dogma. That's what every one of us and every one of our patients have to do because this information is so overwhelming about the toxic world we live in. Most people get immobilized within a week or two of seeing a new doc. You know, they're, they're trying some new, and then they're just overwhelmed. It's just way too much stuff. They can't do this. And they throw the baby out with the bathwater, <laughs> right? Yeah. But if you do one hour a week, every week, just one thing. When you learn that phthalates leach out of plastic storage containers into the food that you store in the refrigerator, and the next day you eat that chicken, it's got phthalates in it. Now, there's no evidence that the level of phthalates that leach out of plastic containers overnight is toxic to humans. But when you learn this and the problem, see, that's how the chemical industry gets away with all this stuff. Well, there's no evidence that the amount of phthalates that leach out of Plastic storage containers is toxic to humans. Mm -hmm. Well, there is no evidence that the amount of phthalates that leach out of nail polish and gets into the bloodstream in three to five minutes is toxic to humans. There is no evidence for any of that. There is none. Mm -hmm. But this stuff is accumulative in your body. So give me 25 years of a girl painting her 20 nails, 10 on her hands, 10 on her toes, uh, 25 years of this. Now she gets mm -hmm. pregnant. Yep. Now, now she gets pregnant and hopefully a healthy pregnancy and a healthy delivery. But if you look, the, they did a study of 346 women in Chicago, measured their urine in the eighth month of pregnancy for five phthalates. They categorized the results into quartiles, the lowest quartile, the next one, the third and the highest. They followed the offspring of those pregnancies for seven years. And when the kids turned seven years old, they did Wexler IQ tests on them, the official IQ test. Not much in medicines, all or every. This was every. Every child whose mother was in the highest quartile of phthalates and urine in pregnancy, compared to the children whose mothers were in the lowest quartile of phthalates and urine pregnancy, every child in the highest quartile, their IQ was 6.7 to 7.6 points lower than the other kids. Every child. That, now, that doesn't mean anything to anyone until you realize one point difference in IQ is noticeable, but a seven point difference is a difference between a child working really hard, getting straight A's, and a child working really hard, getting straight C's. That kid doesn't have a chance in hell of ever doing great, excuse me, but ever doing great in his life because his brain never developed properly. Just go to Google and type in phthalates and neurogenesis, and you see how phthalates inhibit neurogenesis. But there's no evidence that the amount of toxins that leach out of plastic storage containers is toxic to humans. But mom accumulates this over 25 years. Now you've got toxic levels that go to baby and inhibit baby's development. Why do you think autism is so on the rise? It's not vaccinations. If it were vaccinations, every child that gets vaccinated would develop autism. Don't ever say vaccines cause autism. You sound like a fanatic. Mm -hmm. Now, it's rational to say vaccines may cause autism if it takes a child over the edge of toxicity. That's rational. And there's science to that, right? Mm -hmm. So, But it's the accumulative toxins that take us over the edge. So... Those toxins, phthalates, bind on to proteins in your tissue. They bind on to albumin in your bloodstream. Then you get antibodies to albumin, then to this neoepitope, and the, the whole cycle begins again. So whether it's viruses, whether it's 
chemicals uh, from our food chain or our environment, whether it's mold, these, these antigens, these things that stimulate an immune response is what we have to address. But the reason I just said all this is because it's overwhelming for our patients to understand this stuff. That's why one week you go back to the book and you look at the three URLs that I give you for glass storage containers and you go to mileskimble.com, Amazon, and whatever the third one is, I don't remember. You say, oh, I like those. And you order three round ones and two square ones and one for the pies and you pay with your credit card, you hit send. You're, it took an hour, but you're done. And never again will you publish your, will you poison your family with minute toxic levels of accumulative toxins in the body. Give the Tupperware containers to your husband to store nails in the garage. <laughs> really good for that. Really good, right? Yeah. But it took a week to, uh, I'm sorry, it took an hour to order glass storage containers. But that's it for the week. But that's just one thing. Every week, one thing. And in six months, you've nailed this. You've got it down. I would ask all of our clinicians to consider this concept of take the stress off your patients of how they have to change their lives right now. Well, they've got a mobilizing rheumatoid arthritis. Okay. Well, the diet thing needs to start right away, but you have to educate them on changing their paradigm. And that takes time. Mrs. Patient, let's get you gluten-free, dairy-free, sugar-free right now and see our nutritionist or our health coach to help guide you in choosing your foods and all that. But we have to talk about lifestyle in general. And once a week, I want you to do one exercise a week, whatever it is, you'll choose. We'll give you the list. Don't think you have to do it all at once. Just once a week, and in six months, let's just see if you aren't a whole new person, right? Mm -hmm. Love that, love that. And to use one of your your own quotes too, it takes up to seventeen years for new research and new information to come into your doc to trickle into your doctor's office. That's right. right. So, That's right. So a lot of a lot of times when the food industry or the chemical industry is using lines like. There is no current evidence for, you know, these levels to be toxic. There might not be that evidence today, but it's just a matter of time. And so why not start now, right, on the things that we know are actionable? Well, you know, that's, that's an interesting point you bring up. They say there's no evidence that the amount of mercury in tuna is toxic to humans. And of course there's not, because it's not but it's a cumulative in your body. But that's how, that's how they get away with this. It was the Toxic Substance Control Act of 1976, which is still the regulating federal guidelines on introducing new chemicals into the environment. And it was an article in Pediatrics, arguably the most well-respected journal for children's health in the English language. And this was a policy statement now, if you're an author and you're published in pediatrics, you've scored, you know, because that's a, a high impact journal, right? And the review process is very strict. But they published a policy statement, which is not from an author. It's from the board of the American Academy of Pediatrics, which meant they want every single pediatrician to know this. And they said, the Toxic Substance Control Act of 1976 failed miserably to protect our children, comma, and adults. In 40 years now, almost 40 years, it's regulated five chemicals or classes of chemicals, five in 40 years, because you have to demonstrate it's toxic to humans in the dosing that you're exposed to when you're exposed to BPA. And it's not toxic. There's no evidence that the amount of toxins that leach out of uh, carbonless paper receipts is toxic to humans. But every time you grab a credit card receipt, you get BPA on your hands and it gets into your bloodstream every time. But it's not toxic to humans because it's a minor amount of BPA, but it binds to your thyroid or it binds to other organs, it binds to your brain. And this stuff is accumulative in the body. And people don't have that big picture. You know, 
you have to understand the roadmap of how you got to where you are today in order to get back to a healthier you. You can't just drive blindly and say, all right, I'm going back, I'm going back to Iowa, right? You can't blindly say you're going back to Iowa and try and follow the sun, right? You, you have to have a map. And, and the map to health is the reverse of the map that got you to where you are. And adding a new path to get there, perhaps. But you have to understand what is it that's accumulated in my body? What foods are the foods that my body says aren't good for me? We have to understand the map that got us to, oh my gosh, I've been eating wheat my whole life. I love pasta, right? In all of that yabba, yabba, yabba that goes on. Mm -hmm. So we, we have to understand the map that got us to where we are so we then can determine how we get to where we want to go. So if would it be fair to say, even though a virus like the one that we're experiencing is scary, the burden of chronic disease and of hidden underlying disease, the people living in the spectrum is probably a much scarier epidemic or pandemic then to a certain extent, the propagation of a virus would, I mean, what are, what are your thoughts on a statement like that? 82,000 people died in the U.S. last year from the flu. 82,000. No one was up in arms about that. No one was isolated about that. And it took a lot of elders, mostly, like this one has and some younger people, but I mean, how many 800,000 kids are abducted each year in the US? There are much larger problems we have than the uh, pathogenicity of this current virus. Uh, our friend Mark Hyman, I, I heard Mark on a podcast recently say one out of two of us have diabetes or pre-diabetic. I've not seen that study yet, but Mark is a walking encyclopedia on that kind of stuff. So, you know, our blood sugars are way out of balance. We have insulin resistance. Our pipes are plugging up. We've got cardiovascular disease and the kills more. The sepsis kills 250,000 people a year in the U.S., I mean, these are things that are much more potent than this current uh, virus that we're dealing with. I don't mean to minimize the virus. It's, it's important that we recognize this and take proper action. But the level of hysteria around this one, it, it just doesn't fit with the numbers. It just doesn't fit. That's very, that's very good and very fair. I, I profoundly resonate with that statement. And for the people that are, are worried and that they're concerned and that are wondering, how can I build my resilience, knowing that the environment that I'm living in, knowing that the world is changing, knowing that I might be on the spectrum of, you know, of having issues with my immune system. What, in addition to looking at our toxic load, being more conscious of it, what else can we be looking at to perhaps improve, you know, on our resiliency against this type of issue? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. Do you have two hours? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Oh, but, but, but there's a couple of basic things, you know, when we're in our busy lives, one hour a week is all we can alloc allocate. In this current life that we're in, one hour a day, you, you can allocate an hour every day to learn a new thing. For example, one of the most toxic environments you live in is indoors of your home. From the formaldehyde in the ceiling tiles to the scotch guard on the furniture to the um, uh, shellac on the wall on, in the cabinets, uh, uh, the flame retardants in your bedding and in the clothes you wear to go to sleep that we're inhaling minute and now there's no evidence that the amount of flame retardants that are absorbed in sleeping under down comforters is toxic to humans 
That's how they get away with this stuff. But all this stuff outgasses, and we're breathing it all the time. So when you learn that house plants absorb a lot of these toxins, and you say, wow, oh, I didn't know that. Okay, which house plants? And then you go to the book or you Google online house plants that absorb toxins. And you see the pig. Oh, I, I know those plants. Oh, those are, yeah, there's one at the florist. And, and you get house plants in your house to make the air cleaner. The plastic blinds on your windows leach phthalates into the air. Oh, I don't smell or taste anything. You never do. They're minor amounts. But have you ever seen the sunshine come through a window and you can see the dust in the air sometimes, depending on the angle? That's particulate matter that you're seeing in the air, that you're breathing all day, every day. And you want to clean that stuff. You, you don't want it in the air. So maybe you learn about house plants and you get a couple of house plants at Home Depot next time you go. You, you copy or you write down the name of the plants, you know, if it's the, the Latin name that sounds Greek to you, but you go in into the garden say, hey, do you have these? Oh, sure, we got them. And you see there's a whole bunch of them because they're common house plants. And, you know, this, we have handouts on this. The studies came from NASA on what plants absorb toxins. So one day you do that. One day you do glass storage containers. One day you look at organic nail polishes and cosmetics. One day you look at organic clothing that don't outgas chemicals. You know, but every day you do something if you're at home now and have much more free time than ever before. It's the same principle as one hour a week, but now perhaps it's one hour a day that you do. But the primary thing, if there's a primary, there is a primary. Recognize that our diseases that we get, whether they're viral responses or diabetes or Alzheimer's, these are diseases of inflammation. At the cellular level, the cell is always on fire. So the question is, is that a brain cell or a kidney cell or an immune cell? Is it gasoline or kerosene? That that's the way we have to look at this for the map that got us to where we are now with our vulnerability. And then recognize that by far, the most common source of gasoline on the fire is what's on the end of your fork. Most common. So what does that mean? Eat the rainbow diet. Make sure that half of your plate is bold colors of the rainbow. Vegetables and fruits, red tomatoes, purple cabbage, the deeper the blue berries, red raspberries, the deeper the colors, the higher the polyphenol content. Polyphenols prevent this current SARS-CoV-2 virus from binding onto the ACE2 receptor, and it can't get into the cell. If you have high levels of polyphenols, it inhibits that binding, and the virus can't shed, it can't reproduce. You want a plate full of boldly, to boldly go where no man has gone before. That's what you want on your plate, right? Critically important that we have at every meal, well, how do you do that at breakfast? You saute vegetables or you have red raspberries uh, and blueberries and, you know, one cup of, we've known for years, one cup of blueberries a day for three years. And you're thinking as well as you were 13 years earlier. Just read the science, you know, because these polyphenols and flavonoids, they just help your and support your body function more normally. You want resilience? That's how you get resilience. You have to rebuild healthier tissue. You want healthier tissue? You got to supply the raw materials for healthier tissue. And so the first thing is what's on the end of your fork. In terms of systemic, what can we do? Most important thing, in my opinion, and many others, is build a healthy, diverse microbiome. That the, the bacteria in your gut, the viruses, and the bacteria in your gut, well, from the mouth to the other end, the entire uh, microbiome, uh, it modulates. And that's a geek word that means has its hands on the steering wheel. 
And you turn your steering wheel just five degrees, 50 yards down the road, you're off the road, right? So when you have an imbalance in your microbiome, your systems, your blood sugar may not be regulated properly, or uh, the amount of inflammation in your blood vessels, or the number of transmitters in your brain, neurotransmitters, the brain hormones. For every one message from the brain going to the gut, there are nine messages from the gut going up to the brain, directing the concentration of your neurotransmitters. So the microbiome is your primary computer center in the body. It's, it's determining how we function all the time. So what's on the end of your fork? And make it focused on building a healthy microbiome. And if I may, I think this would be good. May I give uh, five concepts in building a healthy microbiome? Yeah, hit it. Mrs. Patient, when you go shopping for your vegetables, please, always organic if you can, if they're available. There are many reasons why. But buy a couple of every root vegetable in the store. Get rutabagas and turnips and parsnips and radishes and carrots and sweet potatoes. Not too many white potatoes because of blood sugar problems, but every root vegetable that they've got. Well, I don't know how to make a rutabaga. Well, neither do I. <laughs> but what I do is I dice it up. I slice an onion, peel some garlic, a little um, uh, coconut oil or avocado oil in the pan, saute it up until it's soft. Add a little peanut sauce or a little red Thai chili sauce or whatever sauce you want, and I eat it. Well, what about turnips? I dice them up, slice an onion, peel some garlic, a little coconut oil or avocado oil, and saute up till it's soft, add a little sauce to it, and I eat it. You just got to get it down there. You know, you, you, you don't have to be Julia Child. And they're safe for you. They're safe. And everybody's been to a restaurant, most likely where fancy restaurant and they peel a little radish and it curls up and puts it on your salad raw. They are prebiotics. They feed the good bacteria in your gut. And you want that good bacteria in your gut. And as an example, and then we'll continue with the five, but the fastest growing cells in the body are the inside lining of the nose, but the next fastest is the inside lining of the gut. And every two to four days, you have a new lining to your gut. And you, so you're building new cells all the time. And those new cells, the, the raw material for those new cells is called butyrate or butyric acid, same thing. And if you don't have, uh, have enough butyrate or butyric acid as raw material to build new cells, you're still going to build new cells, but you build your house out of straw instead of brick. What does that mean? Well, just Google butyrate, low butyrate, and colon cancer. And here come all the studies that you're higher risk of colon cancer if you don't have enough butyrate. Well, how do I get butyrate? Butyrate is the action of the good bacteria in your gut on vegetable fiber. So you want the fibers, and you want different fibers every day because the fibers feed different families of the good bacteria. So don't just eat carrots. I mean, carrots are good for you, but alternate the root vegetables. They're the best source of these prebiotics that feed the probiotics, feed the good bacteria. That's number one. Uh, with number one, go on Google and type in list of prebiotic foods. Print it out. Put it on your refrigerator. And every day you have two from the list. And you'll notice bananas are a prebiotic. Onions are a prebiotic. So one root vegetable and two from the list every day. That's number one. Number two, Mrs. Patient, we're rebuilding your microbiome. So for a couple of months, I want you to take this supplement of prebiotic. And the one that I like is called mega prebiotic, but there are many good ones out there. And just for a couple of months, I mean, my wife and I take it every day. We just put it in our smoothie, but I'm not asking you to do that. Just a couple of months. And you can, and patients will do that. They'll follow you for a little while and take something, see if it works. Number three, Mrs. Patient, get five different types of fermented vegetables. Get sauerkraut, kimchi, 
miso, fermented beets, curry flavored, whatever you want, five different types. And every day you have a fork full of fermented vegetable because when vegetables ferment, they produce many families of the probiotics, the good bacteria. So you're inoculating yourself with the good bacteria. And for the docs that are listening, healthcare practitioners, you see that we're changing a patient's paradigm. We're teaching them to eat differently by holding their hand and showing them how to do this, right? So every day you have a forkful. Well, can I have more? Of course you can. Or, well, I don't like the taste of sauerkraut. I don't care. <laughs> Just take a couple of threads and hide it in ranch dressing or what? Or mix it in your child's mashed potatoes if they don't like fermented stuff. They don't have to taste it. You just got to get it down there, right? And number four, Mrs. Patient, for a couple of months, I want you to take a probiotic supplement along with the fermented vegetables. Just for, I take them every day. You know, I take something called Megaspore, and I like that one. I like the results with spore-based probiotics. But any probiotic that's recommended to you is going to be more beneficial than not taking a probiotic. Because we want to build the diversity of your microbiome. Remember, it's got its hands on the steering wheel of every tissue in your body. So you want the diversity of these good guys that are sending out the control messages. Did you know that one third of all the small molecules in your bloodstream at any one time is exhaust from your microbiome? It's the metabolites from the microbiome. They're one third of everything in your bloodstream. It's like, what? Yeah, just read the science on this. You go, oh my God, I didn't know that. So these messengers are coming from the microbiome all the time through your bloodstream, going to your kidneys, going to your spleen, going to your brain, going to your eyeballs, going everywhere. And it's modulating hands on the steering wheel. All right, that's number four. Number five, Mrs. Patient, get 10 apples, 10, 12, 15 apples, organic, because uh, apples are uh, really high on the list of the dirty dozen, way too many bad chemicals in um, uh, standard conventional apples and wash them, but don't peel them and uh, dice them up, get rid of the seeds, put them in a pot, add water to about one third the height of the apples, add some cinnamon, a couple of raisins if you want, turn it on high, bring it to a boil, let it cook. And when you see a shine on the skin of the apples, it's done. You've made applesauce. Now, the shine on the skin of the apples is the pectin from the apple that's been released. And it's now easily accessible to the good guys in your intestines. And the pectin feeds the development of something called intestinal alkaline phosphatase, IAP, which arguably is the most important enzyme in your gut and you increase IAP levels three to five fold by having a couple of tablespoons of applesauce every day, fresh applesauce. And IAP reduces high cholesterol, reduces high triglycerides in the bloodstream, um, uh, reduces endotoxin, that means the crud that gets in uh, that causes eventually sepsis by 73% stabilizes blood sugar, increases insulin sensitivity, reduces insulin resistance. I mean, the list goes on and on. Supports the probiotics in adhering to the walls of your intestines and colonizing. So you get more of the good guys. This is all from IAP. And you can increase your IAP levels by having a couple of tablespoons of applesauce every day. And the commercial stuff won't work. It's got to be fresh. That's a question that's always asked. So just nail that. So that's the five things. You do that, to, and everybody can do that. It takes a little practice, you know, working with a turnip or a uh, rutabaga. Well, what is this thing? Is a, do I peel it? Well, I don't know. You know, you, you know and, you, and you go to go, and I don't peel any of them. I just wash them clean, and I dice them up, and I add enough sauce to it that it tastes okay. Right? Yeah, I mean, right. you, you don't have to be Julia Child for this. You just need to get it down there, and then you'll explore and find recipes that you and your family like. Uh, my wife now 
rarely ever does she make mashed potatoes anymore. You know, and I'm Irish. I grew up on mashed potatoes, right? She makes mashed cauliflower and it is so good. Oh my gosh, is it good. And, and it's, it's really, and it looks like mashed potatoes. And it's such a no brainer to make. It's really easy. When you see the recipe, you say, what, that's it? Yeah, that's it. That's all it takes. So that's a recommendation on building a healthy microbiome, which is if there's only one thing you're going to do to be healthy, that's it. Build a healthier microbiome. Fantastic. Fantastic. And um, quick question on the science is that because we tend to see a lot with uh, blood sugar disorders that when we increase uh, fiber significantly, it has a very, very positive uh, impact on blood sugar. Is that because there's an increase in butyrate? Is that because you're hitting G-coupled receptors? What's, what's, do you know some of the mechanisms behind that? that we yeah, have? Um, of course, of course. One, is, one of them is the increase in the short-chain fatty acids, like you said, butyrate and propionate and acetate. Another is it increases intestinal alkaline phosphatase. And the third is that it, you, you build the diversity of your microbiome and some of the probiotics are specifically associated with lower risk of blood sugar problems. And so building the diversity of your micro, it comes right back to that again, building the diversity of your microbiome. Wonderful. If, if you had a megaphone, Dr. Tom, uh, to be able to spread a message right now through functional medicine providers in this country. Um, how, what, what type of message would you like uh, the providers that are on the front lines of FM to be able to deliver to their communities when it's time to talk to them about pandemics like this, about the chronic of burden, the the burden of chronic illness. Um, if you if you had that platform, what would be the things that you would want them to be able to deliver to their to their patients and to their communities? What a great question! <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mrs. Patient. Give me three weeks. Give me three weeks and just see how you feel. Gluten free, dairy free, sugar free and the five steps to build a healthier microbiome. Just give me three weeks at that and notice what happens. And what you will see time and time again is that patient's vitality comes up, their resilience comes up, they're sleeping better, they're more at peace, their sympathetic nervous system calms down, they actually have moments of parasympathetic dominance, which is so rare in our culture today, right? That uh, you you make dramatic changes. If a patient is not better in three weeks, doesn't matter what they've got. If they don't notice that something's improving in terms of function, you're missing the boat. You're missing something. I don't care what it is. Stage four cancer. They're, they should be sleeping a little better. Their energy should be up. Their bowels should be working better. Something should be measurable as a biomarker that they're improving whatever they've got, immobilizing rheumatoid arthritis, it doesn't matter. Three weeks, Mrs. Patient, if you do this for three, and of course, for all of our healthcare practitioners, you don't have time to tell people about recipes and their diet. That's why there are functional medicine coaches. And that's why you want a functional medicine coach, a nutritionist, a registered dietitian who's had postgraduate training as part of your team. And if not in your office as an independent contractor, they're outside the office and you refer, but they need to be taking notes that go into the patient's file at your office. You know, when I would refer to a massage therapist, I told them the kind of notes I wanted. I want, I gave them a form, I made the form up, and they mark on the body where's the trigger points and they shade where the referral pain was going. Uh, and you want that with every recommendation. You want the notes. Uh, and it, it's all done electronically now. You know, it's easy enough to do. But if that coach is not in your office, that coach still has to be accountable to you, right? But build the relationship so that you 
so that the patient can get the focused attention they need. And you don't have the time to talk about rutabagas or turnips and what to do with them, right? You just know root vegetables are really good. Get them in there and talk to Kathy, our health coach, on recipes and start exploring that. So three weeks, wheat-free, I'm sorry, uh, gluten-free, dairy-free, sugar-free, and the five steps to building a microbiome. And you, it's a slam dunk for so many people. They start feeling better. Wonderful. Uh, Dr. O'Brien, I could, I feel like I could speak to you forever and ever, but I understand and value your time very, very much. Uh, first of all, thank you. Hopefully um, you can make time for us again in the future to be able to reconnect and expand because the more you speak, the more questions I feel like I want to ask you. And I'm sure that a lot of the people that will listen to this will feel exactly the same way. So um, before we go, are there any closing remarks, anything that you would like to, uh, to uh, wrap up with, um, anything that you're working on that you would want the public to know and resources that you would want to share with them? Well, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for the compliment. I mean, that's the greatest compliment when a teacher hears, man, I've got so many more questions. I mean, that's great. You know, you want people to think for themselves and they have to change their paradigm. And so when you've got questions with enthusiasm for the question, well, but, but what about, you know, enthusiasm comes from the Greek word enthos, that means the God within, right? And so you, it, when it starts churning inside of you and these questions come up, you start exploring to get the answer. My first health mentor was Dr. George Goodhart, the founder of Applied Kinesiology. And he would say all the time, listen with ears that hear, look with eyes that see, because we don't see what's right in front of us most of the time. And we don't hear the messages that are coming through most of the time. You eat something and you feel bad afterwards, don't eat that anymore, right? I mean, there's just simple things like that, that, oh, but it tastes so good. Well, let's find, let's work with the health coach to develop recipes for other things that you think taste really good so you don't feel deprived, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that kind of wraps it up, you know, is to... Listen with ears that hear. Listen to your own body. <laughs> One more thing. Dr. Goodhart used to talk about this. He'd ask, how many people in the room speak Spanish? And a few people would raise their hand. What about French? And some raise their hand. What about Lithuanian? And there usually was no one that raised their hand, but you know, he would do that. How many people speak body? And we all would just look. And he'd say, body language never lies. Most people just haven't been taught how to listen to their body. And so when you listen to your body, you may not have the answer or the interpretive, interpretive guide as to what it's saying, but first we have to listen with ears that hear. Your body's talking to you. And the journey to find out what it's trying to say is the map to get you to higher levels of health. That's the goal here. Awesome. Well, thank you again so much, Dr. Tom. Thank you for your time and thank you for your commitment to the mission of, of moving this model of care, this philosophy of care into uh, common knowledge for our country and for the world. Uh, I'm deeply appreciative and excited to have you again on the podcast soon, if your time would permit. It would be a pleasure. Thanks so very much for the opportunity.